Hello and welcome to the panel uh, discussion on central bank digital currencies and the possibilities of the digital euro. My name is Martin Arnold and I'm the Financial Times Bureau Chief here in Frankfurt where I write about the European Central Bank and the Eurozone economy and I'll be moderating today's discussion. The aim of this panel is to spur the debate on central bank digital currencies and to explore what form a digital currency might take and what role it could play in addressing the societal changes mentioned in the conference title, in particular financial stability and inequality. I'll introduce the speakers and then kick off the discussion by asking them each questions in turn, but I would like to make this uh, session as, as interactive as possible. So I invite you, the audience, to join in and ask questions at any point during our discussions. Uh, don't wait for the end, although we will leave a bit of time at the end for, for questions. Uh, and please use the Q&A function uh, to, to, to ask a question or raise your hand and we should be able to unmute you and allow you to ask it in person. So I'm delighted to be joined by three excellent speakers who are all influential voices in the debate about central bank digital currencies. Firstly, we've got Soleil uh, Omarova, who is professor of law at Cornell Law School and recently published a working paper on the possibilities of CBDCs uh, called The People's Ledger, How to Democratize Money and Finance the Economy. We have Stan Jordan, who is the executive director of Positive Money EU and has been arguing in favor of CBDCs, uh, uh, especially as it could help ease the path towards helicopter money. And finally, we have Miguel Angel Fernandez Ordones, who is a former governor of the Bank of Spain and a regular public speaker and writer on the potential benefits of CBDCs. So let me start straight off with you, Miguel. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, how far are we away from the launch of a significant central bank digital currency? And which one do you think will be first? Well, uh, well, I, I think that the introduction of the CDDC, we could hope that uh, it will be relatively soon. In fact, there are some countries like China that uh, have experimented the CBDC and uh, they could uh, launch this year or beginning next year. They are very well prepared. There are small countries that have launched also CBDC. But then I think that uh, uh, it, it will be uh, the, uh, the, the CBDC will launch, will be launched with uh, limitations due to the uh, uh, the, the danger that could uh, uh, represent to, to commercial banks, to private banks. And that's why uh, I think we could, be, uh, we could uh, see soon that uh, introduction of a public money and digital euro in, in Europe, but with limitations of use and so on. Not limitation of, uh, of uh, people that could uh, use that. That is, I think, the, the, the great thing and the good news of the CBDC that for the first time, uh, the digital euro that exists now and banks could use it, are the reserves, will be open to all citizens and all companies. And that is a great step. But uh, it's true that uh, the, all the benefits of uh, a, a digital euro will be when uh, you have a dismantle or remove the protections and regulations of commercial banks. And obviously, this is something that cannot be done overnight. Every, everybody could understand that is really an important task. It is probably a structural reform as important as the Ten Xiaoping did in China with goods and services. Here would be a structural reform of banking activities that are payments and lending to a small and medium enterprise and household. And then is really a, a, a big reform. And that's why I think it is a good, uh, uh, it's good to start with this small step, the introduction of CBDC, 
because it could have uh, some benefits, even not all benefits, you will maintain financial stability as far you have uh, fragile deposits, or uh, you could have problems even with monetary policy that, uh, well, Stan could talk about that, but, uh, uh, but there are, uh, in my view, two important benefits of the introduction that are, first, that people would be aware of the problems of our, of our system, because, because now people is not aware about the problems. Many, many economists has been writing for more than a century about a fractional bank, but it's something that is well, not very well understood. But if you see how is uh, public money, and you see that the digital public money, the euro digital, do not have bank runs, do not need lending of large resort, do not need, I mean, and so on and so on, then I think that awareness of the people will be important. And the other thing is that even if you introduce with limitation, we could see an important step in liberalization of payments. Not, it's not perhaps as important as financial stability that will continue. It's perhaps not as important as monetary policy that would be important to have a, a, a people ledger <laughs> to, to use that. But uh, uh, I, I, I think that will be very difficult to stop the, 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 the movement of in private initiatives, digital uh, use of means of payments, uh, uh, with uh, 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 even with a limited CBDC. So you think that uh, once people get a taste for it, that it could be it could you know open their eyes to the real the true possibilities. And even if it's a limited launch, that there could then that could prove to be give momentum to this uh, transformatory power of. Central bank digital currency, which could be truly revolutionary. Yes, Martin, because you, they, I think people will see that you don't need to have that enormous building of protections and privilege to commercial bank because the digital euro do not need that. And well, they will realize that you don't need all the suffocating regulation that now have the banks and banks continuously say that they cannot do anything. And then I think that now. Uh, uh, deposit insurance uh, is like an anesthesia for people. People believe that the money in, the, in, in commercial bank is as safe as other money. And that's not true, but the state uh, uh, give that insurance. Then I think it would be a change in this sense and not forgetting the, uh, the uh, competition in payments because payments is very important. It's the entrance of the clients uh, and then, and well, one thing that we could see to see what is going to happen is to, to see China. China is four years ahead in the liberalization and free market in, uh, in banking activities and payments. Then and you could see there, well, that really we are in Western world, uh, very, very retarded in relation to each of China. Let me let me um, ask uh, Saule to, to, to come in on this. Um, given the obvious implications for the banking system, the financial system, and banks are so incredibly important, particularly here in in Europe, where you know we rely on on banks to to, to fund seventy five percent of the funding for for companies and households. I mean, how ambitious do you think this is likely to be uh, in terms of central banks like the the European Central Bank launching? Their digital currencies? Will everyone have their own uh, digital account at the central bank? Or will you think, it, at least in the first instance, will banks remain the intermediaries through which this central bank digital currencies are provided to people? So uh, thank you for that question, Martin. And it is actually the most important and the biggest question in this entire discussion in some sense, right? Because how ambitious or how big this reform or this change will be depends on a variety of smaller choices made along the way. And how those choices are made depend typically on a couple of different types of consideration. So most of the discussion currently proceeds at the level of more immediate practicalities, operational design, operational detail. But another level that needs to be uh, embraced much more directly is the level of 
normative choice. You know, we have to ask ourselves the question, what kind of financial system do we want to have at the end of this long road? Because no matter what choices you make along the way, uh, this introduction of CBDC is a fundamental shift in the current mm -hmm. institutional arrangements. You are absolutely right, Martin, to say that currently banks, private institutions, they're private corporations, they have their own shareholders, they worry about their profits first and foremost. They play an incredibly important role in our financial system, not only because they provide most of the credit and then decide uh, where that credit goes, who gets credit, who doesn't get credit and what terms, but more importantly, they also create money. They create effectively sovereign money. We use our deposit accounts at private banks, which are private liabilities, as if it was just the same as, uh, you know, US dollar or euro, right? Why is that the case? Because the central bank, ECB, or the Fed in the United States stands behind it. There is this whole institutional arrangement where the public, the central bank, backstops the banking system, but the banking system effectively creates money. Now, CBDC enables us to imagine the world in which we don't need that intermediary layer. So now if the central bank can create money directly, opening bank accounts for everybody and effectively uh, making banks unnecessary, now that's the question of choice, right? Because the banking system is an entrenched actor. It's an economic actor. It's a political actor. They have their business to protect. They have their profits to protect. So of course they're going to yell and scream you know, mm -hmm. um, that they this, <laughs> yes, they are. That if you cut us out, then basically the government is never good for anything. There's going to be mistakes. There's going to be inefficiencies and so on and so forth. But is it really so? You know, because uh, if you if you accept the status quo that we have to keep this parallel uh, deposit system where we have the CBDC with uh, some some deposits uh, allowable directly at the central bank, and we have private banks offering deposits, then the design issues become extremely complex. And this is what we're seeing in the current uh, conversation among all of these uh, economists and central bankers, right? Because then you have to figure out how to design that CBDC so as not to drive private deposits out of the water via the, the types of competitive pressures that Miguel so clearly laid out, right? Sovereign money is always safer. It's always more attractive. You know that e you know, ECB is not likely to basically lie to you uh, or you know, take advantage of you in order to sell you some kind of a financial product you don't need, but the private bank might. So the CBDC design becomes extremely complicated. And in that process, what happens, and I'm afraid of it, is that central banks are going to start sacrificing potential benefits to the public in order to make the CBDC, CBDC design less disruptive to the existing system. And that is why my, my preference would be to go bigger and start thinking uh, from not from what the status quo we have today, but from the goal of the financial system that is more sustainable, inclusive, more stable, and then walk back to the design issues. Okay, well, that that is there's some excellent points in there, and we'll come back to some of those, Soleil, in a second. We are getting we are getting some some questions already. We've got three questions already from uh, from the audience, which is which is uh, excellent, and one of them is um, actually in line with the with the question I'd plan to ask you, Stan, anyway, about monetary policy. So instead of my uh, rather dull and boring question. I'm going to ask this question. Um, central bank digital currencies, digital currencies provide higher international spillover. Could you evaluate the danger posed by this larger connection? And will it change monetary policy a lot? Will there be helicopter money, for example? And what interest rate is likely to be paid for central bank digital currencies? That question comes from Agnes Fuge. Sorry if I've mispronounced your name, but there you go. Stan, over to you. Monetary policy, what impact? Great, thanks. Thanks a lot, Martin. Thanks for the questions. Um, I have to say I'm not an expert in international uh, financial flows, so, uh, um, but I think the general issue and then continuing what Soli uh, said, so I think central banks, you know, use, I remember two or three years ago, Benoit Curie, you know, at the time he was leading the ECB's work on this saying, digital euro is a solution looking for a problem. And, and in fact, I think, it may have been right at the time, but now I think the issue is that the digital euro is a solution to many problems. 
Uh, and but we're not yet sure which ones the, they want to tackle first, whether they are the, the big change that Miguel or so they talked about, uh, or whether they want more to fix like kind of short term issues. And this is what the question about what does it mean for manager policy comes in, because some people are indeed arguing that the digital euro is, is a new feature that we need for monetary policy purpose. And this linked to the question. So now we see that the ECB is doing a lot of, of monetary easing, they, they're doing quantitative easing, they're buying uh, assets on the market. And, and one problem with that, it, the money just goes away. Uh, they this create huge turbulences for emerging economies where QE is creating, uh, you know, money flows in, in and out from those economies, for example. Um, and now an issue with digital euro, uh, CBDC is that potentially you, you could exacerbate that in the sense that people could use money, for, uh, you know, digital money account uh, abroad if, if you allow them to. So of course that's a design choice to, to be done. Um, but it also creates a question about, you know, currently monetary policy works by affecting interest rate uh, on banks um, and influencing basically the rates that banks lend to, lend to people and businesses in the economy. Um, and now we are in a regime of negative interest rates where the ECB imposes negative rates on, on, our, on the money that banks put as reserve, you know, leave as excess reserves on, on the central bank account. And the hope is that you know by doing interest rate negative interest rates you you basically pen, penalize people for holding money and the hope and I really emphasize the word hope I think uh, is that this will force people this will encourage people to look for risky investments out there where they would get a higher return uh, and so this is where the question comes in that suppose that if you allow um, digital euro accounts to to be there and to have a zero interest rate uh, where this creates a problem for the central bank because they basically uh, allowing people to escape their own policies, to go away with um, a better option uh, than their current policy, right? So I think this is a problem. But to tackle that problem, we have to understand that the current negative interest rate policy does not work. Uh, I think that that's the issue, actually, that they are going too far in that direction. And the idea that you're going to penalize, by penalizing people, you're going to create positive incentives for people to lend into the economy to look for risk in the, actually we see the opposite because what negative interest rates are doing, they are depressing connectively, I would say, um, the, the economic agents. If you have such a drastic uh, measure on the economy, that certainly means the economy is not doing well and there's something wrong with the system. And that's why I think there's so much concern in certain countries in Europe that the, 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 the negative interest policy is just doing more harm than good. And, and I sympathize a lot with that. So I think the question is about, yeah, what will be the interest rate on, on, on digital euro accounts? And I think this is where we need to go back to what is the purpose of the digital euro account? Um, is it really to, um, to um, yeah, well, what is it? So, and I think here we have to just maybe bring another point which could be seen as a deviation, but then I will go back to my point. We have to make sure that digital euro is different from bank. From bank, uh, from bank accounts. Otherwise, what's the point? People are going to be confused. Yeah. No one is going to use them. So if you want to make digital euro accounts different than bank accounts, than commercial banks accounts, then you have, you have to make it just like cash, you know, physical cash. So in my view, there should be a 0% remuneration on, on digital euro accounts. Uh, so that would be my response. And now, if you're worried about the effectiveness of monetary policy, uh, because of that, because if, if you do what I'm just saying, then you basically allow people to move their money from commercial banks to digital euro, and that would deteriorate, you could say, uh, the transmission of money policies to banks. But then I think this is where we have to bring the helicopter money in and, and think about a different way of stimulating um, the economy. And if you think in very basic monetary terms, you know, um, the equation that we all know, you know, there are two ways to stimulate the economy. One is to increase the velocity of money, and one is to increase the quantity. And there's a debate between Keynesians and, and monetarists about what's the best way. But I certainly think that helicopter money would help on both fronts, uh, in fact, because it would stimulate uh, the quantity of money in circulation. It would also increase the velocity because people who have uh, um, less income would spend more. That's traditional MPC, uh, you know, marginal propensity to consume. So digital euro would help uh, delivering helicopter money. I think that's certainly true. So. If we are going into that direction, the problem to fix the monetary policy transmission will come from, from that, that, that way, making transfers to people through the digital euro account. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think 
um, you know, I've been, I've been champion, Pussy Money has been championing uh, helicopter money for, for almost five years now, and they, there was no discussion on digital euro, and helicopter money is feasible anyway uh, without yeah. digital euro. That's, I think, important to be made. But it's also true that it would be easier for, for banks and more convenient for central banks to, to do it with a digital euro system. And we don't, well, I mean, you don't need a digital euro to do helicopter money, do you? No, I don't think so. I think currently, if we didn't have this conversation on digital euro, you know, the, the straightforward way to do that would be to cooperate with treasuries and to, you know, have, have national central banks. I'm, I'm speaking for euros in context, right? Uh, you would have national central banks asking uh, for, you know, for finance ministries, you know, give us the bank account of everyone that we want to be eligible for the helicopter money program. And, you know, I'm very open to the kind of universalist version of it where you just give the money to everyone or if you want to do a more targeted transfer, you know, both options are completely valid in my view. Um, but yeah, you would need this cooperation. And at the end of the day, you would have the central bank on its own making the decision to, to deliver the, the, the money. So you could do that through the banking system as well. Um, it's just that you would need cooperation with, with, uh, with, with, um, with finance or social ministries to identify the, the recipients. Miguel, you used to run the, uh, the Spanish central bank. Um, so uh, I want to bring you in on this discussion while we're on monetary policy. And, and actually maybe a good way into this is a question that's been asked by one of the audience. Uh, Volker has asked, does central bank digital currency incur additional inflation risks? Um, and I guess helicopter money, people that worry that it could be very inflationary. What, what are your thoughts on that? You're, you're on mute, Miguel. No, no, I, I think monetary policy will be easy and will be better in a world of CBDC, or full CBDC, because you don't have the need to manipulate the interest rate. One of the problems we have now is that uh, Stan mentioned the negative interest rate. Negative interest rates never happen in a market when you have suppliers of funds and so on, never. It's a, it's a result of manipulation of central banks and enormous amounts of money. And that's uh, uh, then with, with CBDC, uh, uh, the central bank will uh, use monetary policy increasing and, 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 and giving the money to citizens or to the state, uh, depend the, the formula that you give. And they will decide with other uh, thousand of people, uh, if they, the price of interest rates, the interest rate will be a result. And you could be, uh, uh, you could uh, uh, get the, the no inflation, no deflation using the money supply, not manipulating the interest rate. The interest rate will be a result. And you will see if with that interest rates and with the behavior of households and so on in consumption and so on, money supply is uh, enough. Uh, so you need to put more, you need to stop money supply, then the, 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 the tools of the uh, central bank will be the money supply. Will not be the, uh, and that is very important because one of the problems we have now is the manipulation of interest rates. And, and I want to use the, 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 uh, the, the precision of Sol about the danger of uh, uh, introducing something and, uh, and, and doing a bad design for the future, because of course, this would be for the future, not for tomorrow. No? And one example is that uh, now the central bankers, I think that mm, the majority of them have seen that uh, uh, put a, a negative remuneration or a remuneration uh, to the digital uh, euro to incentivize the uh, to put the money in deposit banks is a bad thing no but i think it's an aberration to fix as remuneration to the money because the money is an asset is not risky and it should not have any remuneration at all and a bad design in, in, in the in view in the what uh, sol has said would be to put a remuneration to uh, try to incentivize people to use the banks, because if not, you would have problems. But uh, I think that there are uh, solutions that caps in the volume and caps 
to the utilization of CDC that are not so harmful for the future. Because in the future, when you have just only digital euro, uh, that will be the same present that we have with the physical money. Because in 19th century, you had uh, private money, fragile money in banknotes, and then uh, in the United Kingdom was decided, the famous act in 1845, to decide all the physical money will be public. And this is a very similar. In one moment, you will have all public money like the physical. But until that moment comes, of course, you have to go uh, very, very cautiously and so on and, and find a way to, to structural reform the, the private banks. Mm, mm, okay. I mean, um, the, the, the ECB in the paper that they published recently on the idea of a digital euro, uh, they said there were ways to address the fears about um, creating or making it more likely that there'd be runs on, on the banks during, especially during times of crisis, by putting limits on the amount of, of digital currency that people can hold, or having a kind of tiered system of deposits where above a certain limit, you start to charge uh, people, uh, you know, interest on it, negative interest on, on those. There are, there are economies that believe that without caps, I am not so sure. You could deal that, well, uh, uh, lending, the central bank will lend, like Brunemeyer, for instance, or Dean Nippel, that's, they say, well, no problem, because the central bank will lend all the, the money that the private banks lose. I, I think it's too, too, too quick to do that. Probably in the future, you could substitute the money, the deposits that the private banks lose with a, with a, 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 a loan uh, given by the bank. But I think, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think that now we should start, in my view, very, very uh, cautiously because what is important is to have a digital euro and the people could see and compare what is a digital euro and what is a fragile money. Because the money in the private banks is not money. It's a promise to pay. It's not money. It's not deposit. It's a promise to pay. It's not money. <laughs> I mean, it's a promise to pay money. <laughs> then, and people, and not only people, some economists do not see clearly that. And if you don't see clearly that, or what Sol said, that the commercial banks are now who creates money, and you ask this question to many people, and they say, what are you selling? What are you telling? No? I mean, mm. there is a lack of consciousness about our, the, the serious problems we have, financial stability, inefficient monetary policy, and lack of competition in, in banking activities. People is not a word. Then go stop by stop because we need a, a, a back of the electors for a more important reform. Okay, uh, we have we have a, an amazing number of questions which we're never going to be able to to even get to all of them. Um, and and I barely started on my own questions. And, and of course, I think my questions are excellent. But um, but I, I'd like to ask some of these these ones uh, from the audience because they've they've taken the time and the trouble to ask them. Uh, what about this idea um, of um, you know central bank digital currencies being used to introduce a participatory dividend money as a second type of money alongside the so-called double debt uh, or credit debit money, which we call currency? This is uh, a question from Hans Florian Hoyer. Sole, just is this a question that you could you could grapple with? I guess there's lots of questions like this about how it could work and whether you know it, 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 and how it would fit with the existing system. Whether we'd have a sort of right. pin track or or it would just be one instead of the other, or you know how how is this going to work? So I think it's it's important to keep in mind that when we're talking about CBDC enabling certain types of policies, we're only sort of focusing on the rails of the system, right? In other words, it's a technical new path for, for the money to be credited or debited directly to people's accounts by the central bank, right? But uh, what reasons or what goals, uh, what kind of policies should be pursued by using those rails? That's a normative question. 
And so these rails can be used for a variety of purposes. For, for one, for example, uh, it would be much easier, just like Stan and Miguel said, it would be much easier for the central bank to uh, sort of to manage the money supply purely for monetary purposes, reasons, so as to prevent inflation, right? That's one reason why the central bank now will be, will find it much easier to just directly either increase the supply of money in the economy or uh, contract it if they need be. But another reason could be what we now sort of uh, call fiscal policy reasons, right? In other words, if we want people to have a more participatory dividend uh, in, I guess, in the wealth, the economic wealth uh, growth, if we want people to have a little bit better up economic opportunity in our current system, maybe the government will decide to basically credit people's accounts with certain amount of money. That's your UBI variations or whatever, right? Metrics could be different. Uh, the reason could be different, whatnot. And again, CBDC will provide a very convenient rails for this type of, of policy. And I think it will be important to use those rails because ultimately what we want here is to shift the balance of power in the financial system. And we can never shift the balance of power in the financial system if we are afraid of taking bigger steps. So I would advocate for, for, those kinds of, uh, for those kinds of new types of distributions, right? But we have to keep in mind that it is not purely the CBDC issue. It's a broader political and economic issue. Yeah, good, good point there. Um, let, Stan, let me come to you. There's a question um, that, that's been asked, which is, which is very similar to, to the one I was, I was gonna ask you anyway, um, which is about cash and the impact of, of central bank uh, digital currencies on, on cash. Um, and you know, you, you've, we've seen already countries like Sweden that, that were one of the early, uh, the earliest countries to sort of examine the, the potential and, and to, to test the potential for a digital krona because Sweden's cash usage has fallen to uh, a, a very low level already. It's, it's a very digitized uh, economy. Um, what, what do you think about the chances of that? And do, does that mean that, you know, that the central bank digital currencies would have to have cash-like qualities and, and be tokenized in order to be able to be used offline? Um, you know, how, can, how could you address this? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, uh, when Pussy Money started to work on this, um, you can check online the Pussy Money UK website in 2016, I think. My colleague at the time, uh, Ben Dyson, wrote the paper and at the time, you know, we were, I think, the first one in the UK actually to, to, to start talking about it. And the paper is called Digital Cash. Uh, so for us, uh, the idea is primarily that we need the equivalent of cash, or physical cash in an online form. So for us, it's important that, um, uh, that, that, yeah, that the digital euro in the future, which should be as much like cash and for, for similar reason as my Miguel has said as well. Um, and so, um, but, but it's funny because, um, funny or not actually, but a lot of people are concerned that this digital euro or digital uh, currency agenda is, is, is meant to actually accelerate the disappearance and then perhaps the abolition of cash. And I think it's important not, not to, to, to kind of reverse the, the, the response and the objective. So it's not because Sweden is doing that as a response to the disappearance of cash that we should do a digital euro in order to prepare for the disappearance of cash. And in fact, um, as much as we've been uh, pioneering the, 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 this idea in the past, especially I'm thinking of my UK, UK colleagues, um, in fact, Pussy Money are pretty much stands in favor of, of the preservation of physical cash because there's, there are many issues around, uh, around that for financial inclusion reasons. A lot of people in, in, in countryside areas do not have access uh, to digital uh, facilities. The elderly population, it's very hard for them without physical cash. So it's a, it's a major problem already, and, and we certainly don't want to exacerbate and aggravate the problem. So, um, yeah, physical cash has to remain. Um, it's also important that we provide an online version because, you know, it's 2021 as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, 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 the idea to prepare the end of cash is certainly not and should not be, I think, uh, a justification for unrolling uh, uh, an online uh, version of cash. Um, but, yeah, it might as well that, you know, Countries like Sweden, you know, uh, in fact, we, we see the opposite now where people use cash again, but after COVID, I expect uh, the use of cash is gonna slow down uh, globally. 
And this is certainly a good reason why we need to prepare the next stage. But it, I think I, I appreciate the ECB's approach on that front because I think they are very productive of, of, of physical cash. And, um, and I think they've got, the right, uh, they've got the right approach on that front. Okay. I mean, they, some people think that um, central bank digital currencies could be an answer or part of an answer to address um, financial exclusion and, and problem of financial exclusion. Uh, I've got a question here from uh, Dr. Kristopovic, uh, who asks, can a digital euro help people that don't earn a lot of money, like students, hardworking people with low incomes, to establish financial reserves or have more self-determination. Nowadays, you have to pay a lot for just having a bank account. Um, what, what do you think, Sole, come to, come to you on that. Um, what's, what are your thoughts on, on addressing uh, financial uh, exclusion? Well, uh, it, it's, it's actually a great question. And um, financial exclusion is really not an issue of technological lack of capacity. It's not an issue of technology. Exclusion is a policy issue. Again, it's a, it's, it's a political choice in effect of, of some sort. So why are currently people excluded, just like Dr. Kristapovich says, right, from having, from being uh, equal participants in the banking system? It's because they don't have enough resources. And banks that are intermediaries in the provision of banking and money services, they are private companies. They have their own shareholders, they have their own bottom line and profit considerations. And there is no law that can force them you know, to sacrifice those kinds of private profit considerations in order to serve poor people, to put it bluntly. And mm -hmm. therefore, the, you know, the government can force them to some extent, right? Or it can incentivize them. But ultimately, uh, the push is, you know what, if, you know, the public should care about, about providing uh, accessible services to people who are not good economic uh, resource for us, so the government should take care of it. So CBDC introduction would actually make that division of roles transparent. In other words, CBDC central bank is not in the business of making private profits. Uh, those bank accounts do not have to carry fees. They, they don't have to be extremely complex because there is no incentive to create additional services, additional financial products for affluent uh, depositors, affluent clients in order to make more money. So they'll be simpler, but they'll be free and they'll be universally accessible. And to me, that is an incredibly important uh, benefit uh, in, in terms of financial inclusion that CBDC offers, that private banks, no matter how much you incentivize them, are always going to bargain for. In other words, if they will give you more inclusion, they will extract the price. And there'll be very difficult uh, situation for the government to make sure that the price we as a public paying for, that, for those types of more inclusive uh, services is not too high. Okay, uh, well, that's, that's a, a, a very good uh, analysis of that, that question. Um, just there's some, some interesting questions coming in. I didn't really think of central bank digital currencies um, as something that would necessarily be, be linked to the, the climate debate. But there are a few here that have asked questions about this. Uh, so a few of our, our audience, so we should address this. Um, maybe, maybe Stan, you could, you could come in on this because I know that um, climate change is, is something that positive money uh, spends a lot of time thinking about uh, and talking about. Um, so Lee Nassiri, asks how can a central bank digital currency help mobilize capital for climate related investments to accelerate the low carbon transition what do you think it's yeah thanks it's, it's a tough one in fact so yes at Pussy Money Europe we spend a lot of time uh, campaigning for for uh, aligning the ECB monetary policy with, with climate change objectives and then done a lot of work on, on, on quantitative easing green QE and then and now we are also enrolling proposals for financing the, the housing renovation through TLTR operations by the ECB. So yes, we do work for that. That said, on, on, on CBDC directly, I, I do not necessarily directly see the link. Maybe, I've, my, maybe my imagination is, is a bit limited on that one. Um, but maybe I would say maybe something where I think maybe indirectly um, it, it will impact. So I think well, I think what we have to see is that, as it's been said, you know, we, with, with the digital euro accounts, 
system that we will clearly distinguish money payment account versus banks and investment accounts. And I think one thing that's going to have to happen afterwards is, is a big revolution in how banks function. And I think part of that would be peer-to-peer -peer lending type of activities will, will flourish. Equity-based investment uh, might grow as well as a result because basically the financing of the economy will just not rely on this huge pile of deposits that people don't really care about. People will have to be more careful where, where they leave their money. And that might lead to better incentives to finance the economy and maybe more value-driven and objective-driven types of savings account. At least I very much hope so that the banks will come us and to offer us, okay, you can have your money in this account. It will be remunerated at 0.5% or 1%. And we will only finance green activities with that. Um, and I think that would be a strong incentive for people to not put their money uh, in their digital euro account. Um, so this type of thinking may change, but I would not, to be honest, I would not design, if I were a policymaker, I would not design the, the, the digital euro to directly uh, help climate change. I think the, the, the link is a bit too far away, but I, I don't know, maybe people can tell me that I'm wrong in the comments. Um. Yes, Soleil, you wanted to follow up on that, uh, that question. Yeah, thank you. So actually, I would disagree with Stan on this one. Um, not in what he said about the indirect effects. I'm completely in agreement with that. But I think there, there is a distinct possibility for the central banks to make much more direct uh, impact on where capital flows in the economy, including to what extent capital will flow into the green economy, more sustainable projects, or uh, other types of projects that currently do not get funded in private markets. So what I'm talking about here is like, it's a simple sort of accounting issue, right? Uh, if a central bank issues CBDC uh, that resides on the liability side of uh, the central bank's balance sheet, right? It has to just to kind of balance it, even if, if it's not really necessary, but for the optical reasons and for the accounting kind of uh, conventional reasons, it has to balance out that increase in the liabilities on the asset side of, of its own balance sheet. So where would the central bank invest this additional resource capacity that it now has by virtue of offering all these deposits directly, right? So currently, uh, you know, economists like Brunner Meyer that Miguel uh, mentioned and all the others, they're just basically saying that central banks will do more of the same, exactly the same thing that they're doing now. You know, maybe more government bonds buying, more corporate bonds buying, right? Mm -hmm. Basically mm -hmm. invest in the same assets uh, that are already existing, but why not encourage uh, much more proactive investment strategies where the central bank decides that they want to invest in the types of financial products, financial instruments that may not exist today at a large enough scale, but that are beneficially to the public in the long run, including green projects. So now if the central bank positions itself as this new patient investor, provider of capital with a big bag of money, and different set of motivations, then we can see uh, changes in the structure of the financial markets and changes in the types of assets that will be coming on stream. And that's where the asset side of the central bank's balance sheet, I think is a currently neglected potential tool in how CBDC can change the economy. Okay, okay. Um, there's a, a very good question um, that's come through uh, just about, um, uh, the the potential obstacles to launching um, a central bank digital currency, particularly in the eurozone. Um, maybe if I could come back to you, Miguel, on this. Um, apart, from, uh, so this is a question from Daniel Frederick Schultz, uh, who asks: Apart from the obvious interests of the banks, what other political economy obstacles do the panelists see for the introduction of a central bank digital? digital currency in the euro area. Well, Miguel. Let, let, me, let me say that I think that uh, CBDC has many positive benefits in many uh, uh, currencies, but in the case of euro, it has additional benefits. And is the benefit uh, to, to complete and to save the monetary union. I mean, the problem now that we have in the in, and, and people is very well aware, I mean, in, in Ireland, in Spain and others, that the digital euros were not the same in Ireland, Germany, 
Netherlands, Greece, or Spain. The physical euro is the same. Uh, a banknote with 100 uh, euros is the same in Germany, is the same in Ireland, is the same in Greece, is the same in Spain. They are, uh, the value is the same and so on. But a digital euro now, the digital euro now, we are forced to have the digital euro in private banks. And it, the, the, the value depends the quality of private banks. Then yeah, just ask, banks. just ask the depositors in Cyprus a few it's years ago. Not, it's not the same, uh, a, a, a digital euro in Greece, in Germany, and in others. How the authorities are trying to solve that? Because the problem is that we have a cash union. The effective, I mean, the, the banknotes and coins are the same, but the digital euros are not the same because they are private, they are financial fragile assets with risk, and at the end, the state has to help to maintain the value. And that is the, the loop uh, no? between sovereign and banks and so on. And then what are uh, the authorities, the European authorities are trying to say, well, let's uh, have a, a, a deposit insurance, federal deposit insurance for everybody, and let's have a resolution fund because not the states should put. And they all, since uh, many years, they meet and they never <laughs> agree to that. But if you have a, a digital euro, at the end, I mean, if you have the digital euro, you don't need a deposit insurance because the digital euro do not have the problem. And you don't need resolution fund because you don't need, you, you don't in, need to inject. If you have problems, then you have physical euros that are unique and digital euros, that is the digital euro. Then that's why it's something that Europeans should see that is one of the most important interests we could have and complete the European Monetary Union. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Martin, can I? Yeah, Stan, go, go ahead. Very quickly, because I fully endorse that. And I think maybe a more general point of what Miguel has said is that I think for the construction of Europe and, and for, the, for the future of the Eurozone, I think, you know, there has been so many, so much wasted time in political negotiations around deposit insurance at the EU level. And I think it's just, it's just really um, dramatic, just really absurd that so much capital, so much political capital, I mean, wasted into basically bringing or constructing solidarity for banks, you know? And, and I think if as much political capital has been put into building a fiscal union for people, you know, with, with, with real transfers of solidarity between, between member states, I think that would be much better. And so my hope with digital euro is that we can really bury, bury this idiot conversation, you know, the European deposit insurance and talk about other forms of, of you know, capital union between people, if you like, uh, instead of for the financial system. Yes, mm -hmm. A democratization of, of, of money, um, cutting, cutting out the banks. Uh, it's not gonna be easy. The banks are big and powerful and have lots of money to spend on lobbying. But um, the, um, yeah, so, Question for you, just to, to stay with you, Stan, actually. Um, I wanted to ask about privacy because um, in the consultation that the ECB has done on the digital euro, the, the number, they got like a record number of uh, responses, I think over 8,000 responses. And then the number one issue that was raised by many of those responses was about privacy and the concern about privacy. Um, and I guess this is a concern about the government uh, knowing what you're spending your money on and potentially also being able to use it for tax collection purposes and, um, you know, people quite like the privacy of cash. Um, you know, the government doesn't have any way of, of, of snooping on you if, you if you're only spending cash. So, so there's, there's, there's concerns about that. How, how legitimate do you think those are um, in terms of, you know, the, the danger of Big brother watching watching your every move. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think we have to listen to concerns all the time. Uh, they don't come out of nowhere. Um, and and yeah, and it's quite impressive how much response the DCB had on, on this one. We 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 did answer. So you can check out actually our, our, our yeah. I've read your the, I've read your uh, the consultation and but we we were you know we thought we'd be one of the few dozen of organizations working on this and we. Eventually, found out there were thousands of, thousands of people doing it, so it's quite it tells something, right? Um, so, as much as I, you know, and we certainly put in our application that privacy is an important issue, but maybe more in the sense that 
we, again, we, I come back to my point for us, digital euro is, is, is digital cash. Is, is, so we have to re replicate similarities between physical cash and, and digital euro, and therefore privacy is one of them. Um, but that said, I find, I find the concerns around privacy paradoxical, because if you like, it, it's surprising how much people don't seem to care about the privacy of their current transaction when they're using the bank account or their MasterCard, Visa yeah. card, and you know, um, people seem to be concerned about other people knowing what how they spend the money. But you know, when they buy porn online or do other kind of contagious stuff like that, you know, they don't really care that MasterCard knows wh what they're buying or if they're buying uh, alcohol in supermarkets and they use the 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 digital means of payments as well. So I find that we have to recognize that this kind of discrepancy to how much people seem to be concerned about central bank potentially having uh, having some of a side on payments versus commercial profit seeking multinationals already doing that and actually selling your data um, and we've seen that with covid by the way because statistical agencies were very um, inoperational in terms of screening prices in supermarkets so they had to rely uh, on, on on data that um, that payment companies are, are gathering um, and and it seems weird that people are not caring as much on both sides, so I wonder that that why, um, and and that could be because of lack of trust in government for sure, and you know the recent scandals and in, uh, in the U.S. about that certainly do not help, but also concerns perhaps uh, you know and distrust perhaps against central banks, and, and that's something that when we're going to talk about the risk that you know how much is going to be the take up, uh, uh, how much people are going to move to a digital euro um, services. Um, Certainly, I expect great discrepancy um, between countries and countries where central bank uh, trust trust towards the central bank is low. Certainly, this may result in less take up of, of digital cash uh, of digital euro. Yeah, I mean, um, just to uh, follow up on that with with maybe some of the just a question, more general question about the biggest dangers in developing central bank digital currencies. Um, Sole, what do you think are the the big risks here? What are the big the big dangers for you that this could throw up? So the biggest danger from my viewpoint uh, is, as you might have already guessed, um, yeah. doing it halfway. So um, CBDC is such a fundamental change in the institutional arrangement underpinning the entire financial system that it needs to be handled carefully. But if it is not uh, fully appreciated, right? What just how profound the change is. What I worry about that we're going to end up with a system where there is like the, the parallel uh, private money uh, issued by banks, just like we have now, and sovereign money, safe sovereign money, CBDC. And it might create a whole host of unintended consequences because the banks will then try to maximize the potential advantages of still being the primary intermediaries in that system, but now having this much more open spigot of uh, sovereign backup in a way. So what I worry about specifically, at least in the US, is that uh, private banks might actually start um, trying to compete with CBDC for uh, wealthier clients, may start offering uh, higher interest rates, for example, on their private deposits, especially on wholesale deposits that are not um, uh, FDIC insured, right? Mm -hmm. They may start uh, taking the money and using the money from deposits that they have to invest in risky assets themselves, because now they understand that at any point there could be a run, you know, all that money could just, could just leave. So uh, they can hype up the risk of it, right? Are we prepared for the system where uh, now CBDC is sitting there as this sort of kind of last resort option? If there is any turbulence in the financial system, everybody will switch to CBDC right away. But in the meantime, we are not ready to limit the private bank's capacity to increase the riskiness and instability of the existing system. This is the halfway danger, and this is the, the problem that I see that is not being addressed if we're only thinking in terms of how we minimize the current disruption to the current arrangement. Okay. Um, Miguel, can I, um, we, we're almost out of time. We've only got um, four or five minutes left. Miguel, uh, you're on. May, may I? Go ahead, go ahead. On this, because 
Well, so I, I never seen any important structural reform that has been at once. I mean, all reforms, no? You see, and I compare this reform to the uh, vote, uh, the women vote. It's a simple reform. Once you do, everybody understand that women should vote. But if you see the history of women votes, I mean, take a long uh, way. Then, and, and I think that this problem that you say, well, the banks will compete. Well, the banks can compete and can survive due to the protections of the state. If you don't allow lending of large resort, that is one privilege that any other financial institution have, the bank will disappear. If you don't warranty the deposits, nobody put the money there. Then you could use that to say, well, let's reduce the warranty of deposits. Let's reduce the lending of our resource, not at once, but uh, transmitting the idea of the banks that they should learn to operate without the protections of the state. And then that's uh, a, a normal in many structural reforms, because the most important thing to liberalize something is to reduce protections in international trade, in uh, telecommunication, in whatever, you have to take out to remove the privileges and doing in non chaotic form, but obviously step by step. Then that's why the first step that is having the digital euro, I think for me is a very important step and we should support this idea even if, and I agree with you, that you we will not get all the benefits of financial stability and, and monetary policy and so on. It's true, but you are doing an, a, an important step. And I think that's why we should support this idea of, of the uh, uh, European Central Bank. Okay, I mean, just uh, one, one thought that I have perhaps in closing, and I give you all an opportunity, one minute to respond to this. I mean. Uh, Peter Bofinger and Thomas Haas at the University of Würzburg published a paper on Vox this week, which was asking whether central bank digital currencies risk becoming a gigantic flop. Uh, and um, th th this you know, resonated with me because uh, everybody seems to be attaching their hopes and dreams to central bank digital currencies, but there are lots of different hopes and dreams and conflicting and contradictory. Um, and uh, isn't there a risk that we aim to do too much with them and end up achieving too little? Um, Stan, do you want to start on that? Uh, one minute, please, because we're almost out of time. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think, I think it's a major risk. And it, I mean, there's, there's, we, maybe we take it for granted that people trust the central bank and would like to have this, this, this access. If um, I interrupt, so what is, what is the, for you, the most important objective of... Hmm digital currencies if we could finish on that if each of you choose yeah. i what, think for me number one thing if you could pick one thing that they should do that chain came to do for me then it would be about big freedom you know right now the banking system is like a shop where you enter a supermarket and you have no choice but to buy stuff because you have no option to not use a bank you know um so digital currency would provide you with a public service with a public banking system that you can use and that would not be run for profit um so that's for me the major thing. And you may think it's a communist idea, but I, I don't think so. It's the opposite. It would improve the market. It would force the currently oligopolistic banking sector to actually reform itself and to propose better services and to finance better the economy. Uh, so for me, that's a major benefit. And, and I think, yes, there's a risk of a flop, but I think BCB has no choice anyway. And, and that's a risk that they have to bear with and, and they have to go. And because we may realize it may not work for the first few months, but eventually might need in the middle of a crisis. So it's really a contingency plan that they have to go for. Okay, so Leigh, do you want to have your one minute? I agree with that. Uh, for me, the, the most important thing is to use CBDC, that technology, to shift the balance of power uh, in the financial system away from the private sector that currently controls everything, all the flow of money and capital, more to the public sector. I agree with Miguel, it, it cannot be done all in one day. I support CBDC. My point is that if we do it gradually, we have to make sure that we don't allow the private sector to take full advantage of it and the public not benefit from it. Okay. Miguel, you're going to have the final word. I think I know what your main objective is. Um, it's got something to do with the doom loop between banks and sovereigns, but um, you have the final word. 
No, I do. Well, I understand your question. What is the main driver of this? And I think in the short term, in the in the long term, we have talked about financial stability and everything. In the short term, introducing innovation and competition in payments. I mean, when when Libra, when Facebook said, I could offer to 1,700 million people mm. to pay and have payments with a, a mobile that it costs 30 euros. Well, at the central banks saw that they have to offer a digital and go to a, a system of payments that is not bank center, that you have to go through the banks, but uh, payment platform center. And then the banks will be one more in that competitive uh, market. If the things are sold as well down, of course, you could put a, a lot of problems to the, uh, uh, the uh, private initiatives, but those private initiatives are full of good ideas, as we have seen in telecommunications, in travel, in many things, if we allow liberalization and competition in, in payments. Okay, on that note, I think we have to end. Just to say, one of the um, audience members asked if um, the event was being recorded and would be rebroadcast, and I can confirm that it will be. The plan is to, uh, with all the questions and answers, uh, to be rebroadcast, I think, on um, YouTube. Thank you very much uh, to Stan, to Sole, and to Miguel. It's been an excellent discussion. Thank I've been you very much. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. And thanks to you, Martin. Maybe just to the participants that are still in here, uh, just a quick remark. We will now uh, meet in half an hour again in the main room, basically. So we don't lose you in the endless spheres of the internet. Uh, I think we had like on average 100 people, which would have been a super crowded room in a normal workshop environment, but we were digital. So that uh, was not as normal. If you, however, would like to mingle with other people, we have this little tryout um, tool, which is making it possible that you meet in a virtual space and meet up with other people in a separate corner of a room, basically. You can try it out. We tried it before, it is sort of fun and you can meet some other people that you saw in the chat or that uh, attend the conference because this is not, of course, a normal conference environment, but we try to recreate that. Okay, so we'll have a break. You can also just take the break. You can use the Mingle tool and see you back in half an hour. <laughs>